ladies, this is Carolyn Holland here with Fellowship Ladies Bible Study. And of course, anybody, um, anybody who wants to watch is welcome to join us. Um, so we come today. Today is, um, well, it's September 24th, 2020. And we're in the middle of the Days of Awe. Last week it was, we were actually at um, Thursday evening was the beginning of Feast of Trumpets. And then um, there are 10 days until the Day of Atonement, which is coming up this, um, well, it starts Sunday night at e in the evening. Sunday evening to Monday evening is the Day of Atonement. So I want to talk about the Day of Atonement today. Um, so before we begin, though, I want to quickly review um, the feast that we've um, studied so far. Um, because it's something good to, to know. Um, so we oh. so um, I, I before I jump in, let me go ahead and open in prayer and then maybe um, we'll then we'll get started. Okay, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for your blessings, thank you for your love and for the blood that you shed on Calvary so that our sins could be forgiven. I pray that you would lead me, guide me, that you would speak through me. Father, the, you see that everything that's swirling around and, and the distractions that, that have come, but Father, your word is still your word, and Father, I pray that it would be you that speaks through me, and that whoever listens will be blessed and encouraged to continue to um, seek you and put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Now, here we go. Okay, so um, uh, God's, God's agenda, God's um, prophetic calendar actually begins with Passover. Well, I'm having trouble with a paper blowing away. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's the danger of having a fan. You know, everything blows away. Okay, so first we have Passover, and it takes place in the first month of the year. On the 14th day and it remembers um, the Passover when um, they had to put the blood over the doorposts and then the death angel passed over and whoever was safely inside was protected from the death angel and they had to um, uh, kill a lamb and you put its blood over over that and the firstborn were spared and everybody who didn't do that their firstborn died that night and it points to um, Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, who died in our place on the same day. So he died on Passover. At the same time the Passover Lamb was being slain, he was being slain. He died at that same time. So it points to that. Then we studied about unleavened bread. Also in the first month, it begins on the 15th day and it goes for seven days. It recalls when the, the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, they didn't have time for their bread dough to rise, so they ate unleavened bread for a week. And so that it, that's what that recalls, but it points to um, Jesus who was, a sinless, who was sinless and he was buried in the tomb like bread in the oven. And he said, I am the bread of life. And we know that bread is baked in an oven and he was the sinless lamb of God in the, in the tomb. Okay, then we have the Feast of First Fruits, which is the following day on the 16th day. And it um, recalls the first harvest when the children of Israel finally came into the Promised Land and um, they, they ate grain, their first harvest, and they raised it up to the Lord to thank Him for it. And so that's what that was. So they would celebrate that and remember it. But it points to the resurrection of of Jesus Christ who rose from the dead um, on the first day of the week and so he was the first human being to be resurrected in a glorified body and he points to the fact that we will one day um, also be resurrected in a glorified body but he was the first fruits as it says in 1st Corinthians 15 okay then we um, 40 days later we had or 50 days later, we after first fruits we had Pentecost. Okay, Feast of Weeks, 
and it re it remembers the giving of the law in Exodus 20, um, the law being the loving instruction of the Father, and it showed them how God wants us to live in freedom. And it points to the giving of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension. And so Christ's followers were filled with the Holy Spirit for boldness and witness, and then they, um, they were empowered to, um, um, to live the way that God wants us to live because the Holy Spirit now indwelt them. Okay, so then the whole summer goes by, and then we come to what we studied last week, the Feast of Trumpets. Now, that's the seventh month, the first day of that month. Um, and that recalls God appearing on the mountain with fire and thunder and trumpets. Okay, God descended with all that noise and the trumpets, and Moses was called up on the mountain. It points to Jesus' return. In the rapture, it says in the last trump that he's going to descend, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So the Feast of Trumpets points to the rapture. That hasn't happened yet. Obviously, we're still here. <laughs> okay, and the one we're going to talk about today is called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Technically, it's not a feast, nor is it a celebration. Um, but it happens on the 10th day of the 7th month. So while last week we had the Feast of Trumpets, there are 10 days. The first day is here, the 10th day is here. And during that time... Um, is what they call the days of awe. It's a time of seeking the Lord and um, making sure that um, we are right with Him. All right, so it remembers the annual repentance because every year the priest would offer sacrifice, and we're going to look into that in more detail today. Um, and uh, so we have the scripture, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. And so um, that remembers that. It points to two things. First of all, it points to Jesus shedding his blood on the cross for our sins. Um, so that, that is a spiritual atonement. So those of us that receive Jesus Christ as Savior and trust in, in him, um, then we have access. Hebrews 9.12 says, not with, not with the blood of of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so that points to this, but it also points to a day um, at the end when um, the judgment is going to come and all those that have rejected him um, will, will face um, that judgment. So it's an ultimate day of atonement that hasn't happened yet. So it's like a a twofold, many prophecies um, and many pictures of what um, spiritual pictures have two fulfillments. They have a, a current one and then they have a later one. And so there will be a later one coming as well. So now let's have a sip of water and then um, let's get into today's lesson. All right, so... Um, Oh, I wanted to read this too. I, I found this after I put that together. But um, the, these feasts teach us things. The Passover teaches us that the blood is shed to set us free from the powers of darkness. Unleavened bread teaches us that God enables us to walk in a level of holiness undreamed of since the fall because of the blood of the Lamb, because He purifies us. First fruits teaches us that the initial work that God has done in our hearts because of the sacrifice of Passover is just beginning. We know the full harvest will be wrought in us. So there's an, another viewpoint. There's so many different perspectives that we can learn from this that ultimately resurrected. But um, here, this is from um, Michael Lake's teeth. Dr. Michael Lake, he um, pointed out here that the harvest is being brought forth in us as well and in our lives. Um, Pentecost, we are supernaturally empowered by God's Spirit to walk in the ways of God and to become His witnesses in the earth. I think that's more or less what I, what I already said. Trumpets that God begins calling us together to give an account of our lives since His work has begun in us. So that's um, even now. Um, 
he it, it's the beginning of the time of calling for um, the Day of Atonement. Um, but we have the Days of Awe, 10 days to make things right with both God and man. 10 is the number for testimony, law, and responsibility. And we must give an account for the life atonement. We must give account for the life we have lived and the things we have accomplished since we have experienced Passover. And, and it does talk about that, that it wants to die and after that the judgment. And then there's also the judgment seat of Christ where we will give an account for everything that we have um, done and said. Um, in fact, I believe it says every idle word. So we want to be... Be aware of that before the Lord and let God um, lead us and guide us in that. Okay, so now let's um, look at the scripture, um, Leviticus 23. And um, that in Leviticus 23, it gives us um, kind of an overview of how God expected um, this to be uh, celebrated, what he was telling them to do. So... Leviticus 23 is the go-to chapter for all of the feasts of the Lord. All of them, it says, um, God says, these are the feasts of the Lord. And so um, they are um, kept um, to him. Okay, so we start in verse 26. And it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Okay, so this is a, a separate Sabbath. We know the Sabbath is the, sixth, um, the seventh day of the week, but God has also ordained special Sabbaths, and this is one of them, because the Day of Atonement does not come on a regular Sabbath. It comes, um, well, in this case, it comes... Sunday evening to Monday evening. So actually, that's the second day of the week. So let's um, look at that. So those are the things. Um, a holy convocation, which is a dress rehearsal. Uh, afflicting your souls. Um, afflicting your souls. I had that written down too, but I seem to have... Well, here it is. That afflict your soul from the Strong's Concordance. It means... Um, to be afflicted, to be busied with, to afflict, oppress, humble, be afflicted, be bowed down, to put down, become low, to be depressed, to be downcast, to be afflicted, to stoop, to humble oneself, bow down, to be afflicted, be humbled, to humble, mishandle, afflict, to humble, be humiliated, to afflict, to humble, weaken oneself, um, to be afflicted, to be humbled, to afflict and to humble oneself and be afflicted. Uh, from a primary root um, through the idea of looking down or brow beating. So the usage, it's translated most often as afflict, but it's in the uh, King James it's also translated as humble, force, exercised, sing, leonoth, troubled, weakened, and some other usages. This of all days is a day to humble ourselves before God, for we are approaching the judgment bar of the Almighty. So this is um, a time to look to, to do the, the self-searching. Like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 when he said, examine yourselves. Um, so that's something that we should do on a regular basis to make sure that we are indeed right with God. Now, that does, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about in our daily lives. Um, so I, want, I have this model out here. I don't know if you can see it. If you can't, well, I'll tilt the camera just a little bit so that maybe... There, wait. Well, I, well mm -hmm. I hope that you can see it. So um, the tabernacle was laid out in such a way that the brazen altar face the east and so what they would do um, let me just kind of walk you through it 
in Exodus, not Exodus, in Leviticus 16, he it gives the whole story exactly what he's supposed to do, but I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. First of all, the high priest would take a bowl, and he, well, before that, it was the high priest's job to bathe himself and cleanse himself and put on um, clean, a clean linen tunic under all of his garb. So he had to make sure he was right first and clean. Then he would go and then he would go and he would kill the bull and the bull would be burned on that altar. But he would take the blood and I'm going to get some the blood here. It's actually not blood, so don't anybody freak out. This is we're going to pretend this is blood. So then he would take the bowl of blood over. He would bring it. Well, he didn't put it in the in the laver of water, but he would take the blood and he would go into with the blood of the bull. He would go into the holy place, and then he would go into the most holy place, the holy of holies, and he would sprinkle the blood on the altar. And the purpose of this first cleansing was to cleanse himself. Okay, so he would, that was, that was to get atonement for himself and his family. So there's um, a picture there of, that we need to, um, we need to take care of our own um, uh, relationship with the Lord before we take care of somebody else's. So then he would go back out and they would have two identical goats. There we go. And they would be presented actually at the door. So they would be presented at the door there, the two goats, and they would, they would cast lots for the goats. One would be for the Lord and one would be the scapegoat. In Hebrew, that word scapegoat is Azazel or Azazel. And in some of the newer translations, they don't write scapegoat. They put the word, the Hebrew word, Azazel. And what's what I found interesting when I read this is that I had just read the book of Enoch. Now, don't think that I'm um, saying that the book of Enoch is necessarily inspired. But one of the one of the fallen angels that that came down in in um, uh, Genesis 6 he was like the, the leader of the ones that committed that sin in Genesis 6 his name was Azazel and he was guilty of teaching um, all of mankind all kinds of evil and it was said that he was going to be um, buried he was going to be imprisoned in the wilderness and um and then it actually states there, let all sin be attributed to Azazel. And, and so um, I think it's an interesting thing that the scapegoat, this is not the scapegoat, that the scapegoat is Azazel, it is Azazel. And when the priest puts his hand on the head of the one that's to be the scapegoat, he's confessing all the sins of Israel on it. And he's sending it out to the wilderness as Azazel and so it, it kind of matches that all sin is ascribed to Azazel that's they they name that goat that one the other one is um, the one that is for the Lord and that is the one that is um, sacrificed and its blood my priest back up its blood is then taken by the priest back into the into the Holy of Holies, back in here, and his blood is there making atonement for all of the children of Israel. So you can see down inside of there. I don't know if you can see, because I can't see what you're seeing, but okay. So there it is, down inside of there. And then he goes back out. I want you to think just briefly about a scripture that's found in Psalms 110. I'm going to remove the tabernacle because it takes up my whole table. And I'm going to 
show you this diagram of the tabernacle. So this might be a little bit better. And camera in just a little bit. Okay, so there's a scripture. Um, let's look it up in... Oh, I don't have it written down, but I have it written down here. It's in Psalm 103. This is just in passing. Psalm 103, um, 10 to 12. So everybody go to Psalm. Hi, Gloria. Psalm 103. 10 to 12. It says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I want you to notice something that's really cool. The tabernacle is um, set up according to the pattern that, that Moses saw on the mountain. So the tabernacle of Moses is actually patterned after the tabernacle in heaven. And it's, they were told to set it up so that the side that was the outer court where the brazen altar was faced the east. And so notice that the, the priest would come in here, he would sacrifice the bull and the brazen altar, and he would come in and sprinkle the blood of either the bull or the goats here. And that was the end of their sins. That's where atonement was made. Atonement means covering. So they started in the east and went to the west. As far as the east is from the west. So, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So that's kind of a, a cool little thing that the tabernacle was even set up that way. So that the, the person was coming in, they, were, they would have a sin offering. It would be on the altar. And then it would be brought in once a year on the Day of Atonement. It would be brought in to the Holy of Holies to make atonement. And that would be the end of the sin. It was atoned for. And so we know that if you keep going west, you know, you never start going east because the, the world is, is a sphere. And so I, um, I read um, a devotional recently in... Um, in the book of mysteries by Jonathan Kahn and he brought that out and I thought that was a really kind of a cool thing to share to share with you um, so how did Jesus fulfill the feast well I um, I have this wonderful book and you're looking at it backwards but it's called celebrating Jesus in the biblical feasts so um I I, um, I highly recommend it because it shows us the historical aspects of the feast and then it also shows how Jesus fulfilled it and it, then it shows how it works out in the life of the believer and then um, how we can celebrate it as Christians. Okay, so I'm going to read some of what I'm going to share with you from this. Um, because they word it very well, and I wanted to share it with you. Um, we'll be in Hebrews for most a lot of these scriptures. Hebrews also in First John. So you can, if you're using your Bible today, since this is a Bible study, then um, I encourage you to find it. Hebrews is in the New Testament. It's almost towards the end. It's before James and the Peters and the Johns. So. You go backwards, first and second, third John. Before that's first and second Peter. Before that is James, and before that is Hebrews. So kind of going backwards. There it is. All right. So Jesus fulfilled this the spiritual aspects of the Day of Atonement when he went into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood. Um, he shed for the sins of the world. Um, so let's look at that in Hebrews nine, verses eleven and twelve. It says that, it says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Okay, so um, he, he went with his own blood. Every year the high priest would go in with the blood of bulls and goats. It says in 13, for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, and then talks about um, being a mediator of a new covenant. Okay, so, um, so believers have been forgiven and made clean once and for all. We just read that. By the blood of Messiah Jesus. His blood did what the blood of bulls and goats could not do, could never do. The blood of the bulls and goats just covered their sins. That's why they had to do it every year. Because it would only cover their sins. Um, it took them away. It took the sins of Jesus' blood. Took them away. Took our sins away to be remembered no more. As far as the east is from the west. Okay, so. Um, now, God, um, we receive this great blessing of forgiveness once and for all when we repent of our sins and with a broken and contrite spirit we accept Jesus Christ as the innocent substitutionary death sacrifice so he took our place um, when he died on the cross um, so at that moment our future is sealed by the Holy Spirit and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life this is a finished work of redemption and salvation regarding our position before God so that is our position. When God looks at me, um, or he looks at you, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you've, you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and um, allowed and repented and allowed him to, um, to give you his life, like it talks about, then this is you too. So when God looks at, at Carolyn, he doesn't see all of Carolyn's, sins he sees the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all sin that's what he looks at and that is my position that's the work of redemption and salvation regarding our position before God so it's a little bit like um, you know um, if you have young children or if you have had young children or if you have taught young children um, you love those kids and you see their mistakes and you correct them regularly. But if someone else comes along and says, um, your son or your daughter is blankety blank, you will defend them and you will say, my daughter is fine. My daughter is perfect. In your eyes, your daughter is perfect. But inside the four walls of your home, you are continually guiding and correcting your daughter. And so that's the way it is. Positionally, we are before God. We are perfect before God um, because of Jesus. Because Jesus took his blood and he didn't go take it to the, the um, Ark of the Covenant or into the Holy of Holies. He took it to the Holy of Holies up in heaven. Um, so, um, but now, even though that is true and we need... Um, there's a secondary thing. Even though God has forgiven us of our sins, this does not mean that we do not need a continuous cleansing. Like when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Peter says, um, Oh Lord, don't, no, no, not, no, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, um, Well, if I don't, you have no part with me. And, and Peter said, Well, yes, do it. And, and Jesus said, You don't understand what I'm doing. He says, You are all clean. But, but um, you just need to have your feet washed. And so the idea is um, we may be clean. You know, have you ever, um, you've had your shower in the morning and you're all clean and all purdy and everything. And then you go to um, a restaurant and you eat spaghetti and it spills all over and my Tell it not to do those things. Okay, well, <laughs> Nemo, though. All right, so um, um, so we need a, a continuous cleansing. It's like we get our feet dirty, we get our face dirty with spaghetti. It doesn't mean 
that we're not clean, it means that our face is dirty or our feet are dirty. We slipped in the mud and, and, and our clothes got dirty. But it doesn't mean that we're not clean um, on the inside. Okay, so it's our job to judge our sins daily. Um, Paul told um, the Corinthian church that they needed to judge themselves. Otherwise, they would be judged. We can go quickly to 1 Corinthians 11. Um, where the Lord's Supper, it starts in verse 23, um, but I want you to uh, go to 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So if we are um, we are born again, this is talking to believers. This is not talking to somebody that doesn't know the Lord. And so what he's saying is you need to judge yourselves. Um, we, we know that we're born again, and we know that um, positionally we are pure before God. But we know very well that we are not pure. I mean, we're all famous of saying, well, nobody's perfect. Well, no, but the goal is, our goal should be to um, work towards that goal of being perfected. And he says, if we judge ourselves. So it's kind of like if you're taking a test. I, I was a teacher for 30 years, so I'll, <laughs> I'll always revert back to that. But let's say you're taking a test like the the star test or the tax test in times past. You're taking that test, then the teachers would always say, go back and check your answers. That is judging yourself. Because if I go back and I find out that I did number one wrong, I'm like, oh yeah, that should have been this, and I changed the answer, then when that test is graded, number one won't be counted against me because I already judged it, I already corrected it um, as far as the test is concerned. But if I don't, then I'm going to be judged with that problem being wrong on the test because I didn't go back and check it. And so in the same way, we are to check our own lives on a daily basis um, before God. Lord, am I right before you? Am I doing that which pleases you? Does my life bring honor and glory to you? Did I mess up today? Did I have a bad attitude? Was I prideful? Did I tell a lie? Um, was I harsh with somebody that I should not have been? Did I judge somebody um, uh, falsely? Okay, so it's we are judging ourselves before God. And then we don't have to be judged. This is all part of um, the atonement, the continuous cleansing. So, so we are positionally, we are clean before God. But in our daily in our daily lives, we are not. And so um, that doesn't mean we're not saved. It means we need to have our feet washed. We need, to, we need to wash our face. We need to check our answers. We need to check before God. Um, uh, because that way, if we check and correct and we repent, he says, if we confess our sins. So if I confess to God and say, Lord, um, today I was prideful. Please forgive me. Then I'm not going to be judged for that. But if I continue on in that sin and I never bring it to the Lord for cleansing, then my Heavenly Father, as a good father, is going to chasten me. I'm going to get a spanking someday for it. But he doesn't literally turn me over his knee and literally give me pow pow. It may show up as a sickness. It may show up as an, as an unexplained or an unexpected expense that, I, that I'm going to have to pay for. It may show up in poor health in general may show up in different kinds of ways. Um, it says, For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. So we are very famous and quick to say that not all sickness, not all, you know, is, um, is you're being punished for a sin. But we're so quick to say that. What we should be quick to say is, take it to the Lord in prayer. Ask God to show you, not me tell you, not the pastor tell you, 
but you get on your face before God with your Bible open and say, Lord, I'm suffering these things. I don't understand why. Can you please show me? And God will show you. If, you're, if you come to him and your heart is desiring to know um, what's right and what's wrong in your life, God will show you. And I, I will have another lesson about that that we go into more detail about that. But that is something to, um, to do in, on this Day of Atonement. Okay, um, let's go to 1 John 1, 6 through 9. It says, if we say that, um, by the way, 1 John, go to Revelation, go backwards, Jude, and then there's 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. So it's, that's probably the easiest way to find it if you're looking in your Bible. Hi, Angela. Okay, it says in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, so um, the the idea of um, constantly bringing ourselves to the Lord and confessing our sins is a matter of maintaining fellowship. Okay, because if we start letting, letting this little sin and that little sin, that attitude and the other attitude build up in our lives, it builds up like a wall between us and him and then that fellowship that we desire to have with him or that fellowship we desire to have with other believers isn't going to happen um, so we um, as human beings we don't usually repent um, easily and when everything's going well because we think we're just fine and then all of a sudden um, so then God will often allow various trials um, to test our faith and to get our attention all right um, like students at school, oh, I know, I know how to do it, I know how to do it. So you give them a test and they get half the answers wrong. And then they see that, oh, no, I don't know how to do it. I, I need more instruction. And this is the same way with us. We might think we're all just fine with the Lord, but then something comes into our lives and we're like, Lord, what, what, what's wrong here? And then God will show you. And then you'll say, oh, I didn't understand that. Now I know. Um, forgive me. And then you work to to get that right so it is it is Jesus desire to purify us by his word um, in John 15 3 it says you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you however if we will not heed God's word then Jesus will allow us to experience a baptism of fire in order to purify us okay so um, let's take that I, I kind of made that a personal application of uh, Jesus fulfilled the Day of Atonement by um, bringing his blood into the Holy of Holies, just like the high priest did in the Holy of Holies. And when we trust him as Savior, then, then we are made clean and positionally we are with him in the heavenlies. But let's go um, a little bit more um, to um, our, how our response should be. Um, so we know that Jesus was crucified for our sins. So our response should be to die to self. Ouch. <laughs> we don't like to, that. Die to self, take up our cross, and follow him. All right. So that's not easy to do, to die to self. All right. It's not easy because we don't like to be wrong. Or Well, we don't mind being wrong. We just don't like somebody to tell us that we're wrong. Okay. Um, we are very protective of ourselves and our egos. And it's a process. It's a process. Just like, you know, your infant baby is a full human being, but you have to train that baby how to have self-control as it grows, how to, how to be truthful, honest, hardworking, responsible. All those things have to be trained. And so God trains us in the same way. We have to train ourselves. We have to put those, our favorite sins, we have to put them on that brazen altar and and death to that self we need to put ourselves there and um 
so that we can walk in newness of life with him. He was buried with our sins. Our response is to put off the old man, the old man of sin. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Likewise, we who were dead in our trespasses and sins have been raised from our spiritual grave to walk in newness of life. So that's our response since Jesus fulfilled that, the spiritual aspect of the Day of Atonement. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, and we too must be filled with the Holy Spirit to enable us to minister um, in the power of God. And sometimes it comes easy and sometimes it doesn't. You know, when um, we have our good days and we have our bad days, and sometimes it's in those bad days that we really surrender to the Lord and say, God, I, I can't do it. You know, I, um, it's, been, it's been really rough the last few days and I haven't had the time and the ability to really get in and study this, Lord. So you, you're going to have to speak through me. You're going to have to do this through me. And then the Holy Spirit takes over and he enables us to teach or to do, or to be whatever it is, whether whether we're homeschooling or whether we're teaching in a school or whether we're working on a job somewhere, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit will enable you to do whatever it is that God has called you to do. Um, Jesus encountered spiritual warfare. We will encounter spiritual warfare. Um, and so um, those are things that... that um, we learn from that. We learn how to stand up to it. In James, um, it talks about submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, we talk about resist the devil, but what about submit to God? If you don't submit to God first in confession of your sins and put to death the flesh in those areas, then when the devil comes to get you or to trick you or to lead you into some kind of sin, you can't stand up to him because you have not closed those doors. And that's part of another lesson we'll have going on. And so one re this is one reason why weak, carnal, cultural Christians do not experience the blessings of God. Because they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They have not been filled and infiltrated completely with the, Baptist, with the Holy Spirit. Okay, they are unwilling or unable to walk with him to tabernacles. God will help us if we will allow him to work work this in our lives. So we can say, you know, Jesus, he was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of his baptism. Uh, Luke said that, he, uh, well, John the Baptist, and it was recorded in the book of Luke, that um, he that he was going to baptize, that John baptized in water, but Jesus would baptize us with fire. And so, um, that that is that is what is talking about there. Jesus was also judged for our sins. Therefore, we must judge ourselves, or He will chasten us so that we will not be condemned with the world. And so, here's another uh, point about that. We did talk about um, correcting ourselves so that um, God doesn't chasten us. But the reason He will chasten us if we don't correct ourselves is that the world is watching us. We are a picture of Jesus. We are a picture of, of what it means to walk with God. And so if we are walking in some kind of sin, and then people look at us and they say, well, I thought she was a Christian. Why is she acting like that? Why is she talking like that? Why did she cheat me? Why did she lie to me? Why did she do whatever? Or driving down the road with a bumper sticker saying, I love Jesus. And then you cut somebody off or you're honking at the horn or you're sitting at the red light looking at your device. And it turned green 30 seconds ago and everybody's honking at you. And they see, I love Jesus. Well, Jesus is going to, through the Holy Spirit, will chasten you for those things because you make him look bad you we present a bad testimony and there are countless of people that are on their way to hell today because they were interested in coming to christ but the people they saw that were christians weren't living a life that resembled jesus christ they couldn't see jesus christ in those people and they said well if that's what it means to be a christian i don't want it and they turned away 
And so he says that if we judge ourselves, he's not going to judge us. He's not going to give us a spanking if we correct ourselves as we read the word. And we see, oh, I shouldn't be doing this or acting like that. Okay, so then, Lord, forgive me. And we change. And um, we put off the old man and put on Jesus Christ. And they say, okay, Jesus would behave like this. Jesus would do that. And so then, then he doesn't have to spank us because we corrected ourselves. But if we continue on in that, w once we become aware of it, he will chasten us in some way or another so that we're not a bad um, testimony to the world. Okay, so in the prophetic... Um, I want to go quickly to that. The prophetic season of the Day of, At of Atonement points to the return of Jesus to judge the earth. So judging is, is looking at and either vindicating or um, condemning, one of the two. So, um, but we, it, and it does say at the end, everyone whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then they they went to one judgment. So that implies that everybody whose names were in the Lamb's Book of Life are, um, are receiving their eternal reward in heaven. Okay, so this future event will literally be fulfilled on the final day of atonement. And so um, when, when God gave the feast, the feast of the Lord, this is a, a, like a, what would you say? It's a calendar of God's plan of redemption. And so we look at it, we can see Jesus in each and every one, and we can see that um, how he fulfilled it and how he is yet to fulfill it in the future events because they have like double fulfillment. Um, then how should we celebrate it as Christians? Because we know he gave that to the children of Israel, but you know that there were non-Jews, non-Israelites -Isra that were living amongst them. And there's a, a scripture that says that um, whether it's an alien among you, the stranger, or yourselves, it's the same law for for the for you, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as for the stranger that's among you. But we've been forgiven of our sins because Jesus atoned for them. So how do we look at this? It says the Day of Atonement is a day of afflicting. Our souls, which is Bible talk for humbling ourselves before God. James was referring to this when he wrote, um, and this is in James 4, 8 through 10. If you're taking notes, you can look it up. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So that is something that we can do as born again believers at this time. We can sit, search our hearts before God. What in my life, Lord, needs to come out of my life? What, what do I need to seek forgiveness for? What do I need to confess um, before you? Um, John says, and, and we already read this scripture, if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Um, so in addition to seeking forgiveness from God, this is a good time to also forgive those who have harmed you and seek forgiveness from those you may have harmed. So as this day of atonement is coming up, then it's time. it's a good time I mean, we can do this anytime. We can pray and seek God about this anytime. But since these are appointed times, Moedim, they're called in the Hebrew. These are appointed times that God set, said, these are my appointed feasts. These are my appointed times. And so in this particular time is a good time to do this. Um, so one is to seek um, God to show us what we need to change in our life, confess it, and ask God's forgiveness. Another is, if somebody has harmed us, we need to forgive them. Because God cannot work in our life if we're walking in unforgiveness. Since he has forgiven us so great a debt, we certainly should forgive others the relatively small debt that they owe us. So, um, in closing, Yom Kippur is a good time for Christians to read Leviticus 16 and 17. We just, I talked about it 
Um, if you want to know more about it, I'm going to be um, teaching on a different aspects, focusing in on the scapegoat a little bit more um, with the youth lesson that I'll be putting out tomorrow or the next day. Um, so, you know, heads up for that. Um, but uh, read that, the account of the crucifixion of Jesus and the Gospels. It's a good time to confess our sins to the Lord, as we've said, and to one another. It's a good time to repent and accept the blood of Jesus as our basis for forgiveness and to begin a sweet new year with the Lord and our loved ones. And so, well, actually, this isn't the new year that um, some people um, say. Uh, well, the Jewish tradition is that they started the new year last week on um, the Feast of Trumpets, which is also called Rosh Hashanah, ahead of the year. And in God's calendar, the beginning of the year happened before Passover, that month that Passover is in. But um, I challenge you, just remember that... Um, God loves you and he wants you to to be perfected and so we can continue to seek him let him show us the ways that we can crucify our flesh crucify ourself and walk in newness of life with him let's pray dear Heavenly Father we thank you for your love and care we thank you um, that you gave us pictures of the atonement uh, so that we could understand how that works with you we thank you that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and, and presented his blood in the Holy of Holies in, in heaven so that when we receive his forgiveness, that we are seated with him in the heavenly realm. Father, I, I pray, I also thank you that you love us too much to just let us live however we please, but you are guiding us and teaching us and you, you instruct us and sometimes you have to chasten us so that we can um, walk in the way that you would have us to walk. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, thank you for joining me. Hi to Lisa and Dolores who joined um, us just a little bit ago. Um, I, I hope to see you next week. And next week, we will get into the joyous celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. God bless you. Bye-bye.